Well, good morning again, church. My name is Travis. It's good to see you. Listen, if you didn't hear at the announcements, tonight is going to be a vision night. And if you're like, I'm not totally sure what that means. Uh, it sounds important. It is pretty important. We're headed into a whole new phase with uh, Grace Community Bible Church. We have the opportunity to move physical locations in the next few years. And so if you're wondering how we got here and what that means moving forward, this is the night. So be here tonight to make sure you know what's coming and how you can be a part of it in all the different ways, because what God has planned, it really is miraculous, quite honestly. And you'll hear from a guy named Tony Plummer, who it may have been a while since you heard him, but he's the actual pastor here. I was, I was doing check-in last week down in the, uh, with Grace Kids, and I had a mom uh, checking in her kids, and she was wonderful, and I, she kept on looking at me. She goes, so who's the pastor here? She's like, you were on stage like last week, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Doug Crawford's up here. He's going to do awesome. And, uh, and he did, by the way. And then uh, she goes, oh, so it's not you. I said, how long have you been coming? She goes, since about the new year. I was like, yeah, that's right. So uh, if, if you don't know Tony Plummer, he's an awesome guy, uh, wonderful pastor, great preacher. So you'll get to see, it, to see him tonight, hear his story, and hear the story of Grace Community Bible Church. And it's wonderful. So be here tonight. Uh, is that 4 o'clock when that starts? Thank you, God. <laughs> I feel like I should have been telling you that. But here we are. Uh, you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. You can peel apart the gilded edges of your Bible in 2 Chronicles. Tap to there. And I want to talk about a story that you might not be familiar with. It's with a guy named Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Israel at this time. But I want to tell you why, I'm, why we're telling this story before I get to the story. The, the nature of being a pastor, especially working with children, working with students, any kind of pastoral ministry, you have a lot of hard conversations. And you have conversations where you sit across the table from somebody, or you're sitting in the same small group room as these kids, and they're telling you things that you think, I desperately want to fix what's happening in your life. And you just, you're spinning in your brain, like, who can I talk to? How can I address this? And a lot of times, there's just not a fix to it. There was, uh, there's one person who made a 30-second decision. The decision that they made lasted about 30 seconds. And for the rest of their life, it's going to be affected by that 30 seconds. Some of you in this room have made a 30-second decision that you still look back on, and you just, it's, it brings on a wave of shame when you feel it. And that's what this person just walked through in a fresh way. And there's another, there's another couple of kids whose uh, parents have split, and they're just, I, I'd heard one parent's story, I'm like, oh man, that's terrible, I'm so sorry that's happened to you. Then I heard the other parent's story, and it was complete opposite, but both terrible. I'm like, oh man. It, it kind of doesn't matter which one of these is true. Chances are there's some combination of both, but they're both pretty awful. So when you're the you know, 13 and 15-year-old, you're just stuck. There's no way out of that. Your parents tell you that the other one is terrible. The other one tells you that the other one's terrible. And what are you supposed to do with that? One person locks in a control, try to control the situation. The other kid says, this is all chaos, I'm going to blow up everything anyway, so it doesn't matter. And you're trying to help, but this is an insurmountable foe. Then I sit across the table from, from a woman whose husband is done, and he is, he is quitting on the marriage. And it's been pretty rough, but he's done, and I want to help but I can't change his heart. We've all been on both sides of that table. We've been on the side where you're sitting there thinking, I wish somebody could snap their fingers and, and get me out of this. I wish somebody could just give me the right answer. What if I just had the right verse? What if I had the right prescription of prayer time plus Bible reading time plus small group time plus Sunday morning attendance? Would that like, is that the equation, the right chemical compound that fixes this problem? And it just doesn't. And so much of these moments 
on my side of the table, the pastor's side of the table, is what Jesus said, you hurt with those who hurt. And I've had to kind of reconcile this reality that that's a big part of, not a big part, the only thing I can do is pray for you and hurt with you. And that sounds like, dude, there's got to be something more. But that's really everything. There aren't other parts to it. The kind of foes that these people are facing, kids and adults, this isn't just a kid thing, it's not just an adult thing, it's a life thing. And if you're out of that crisis, there's another one coming, and we don't know how far away those mountain peaks are, those valleys are, but we live in this ebb and flow of these moments. And it's a, I was talking to Tony about it last week, it's a, and he said, you know, it's a sacred privilege to walk with somebody through their hurt. And it is, but it hurts, you know? And I told him, I said, I don't think I make a very good therapist, so like, a uh, very good counselor. I, I don't know how to leave work at work in that, those parts. It just it sticks with you. And you're supposed to care. And I, I, I don't want to get to a point where I'm so detached emotionally from the lives of those we're working with that, uh, well, I guess I can check that box off. I'm in my vehicle driving home now. But at the same time, I'd like to be able to sleep like a whole night. So it's a balance, you know. So what do you do when you don't, what do, what do, you do, when you don't know what to do? And that's kind of what the story is. What do you do when you do know what to do? If you have a headache, you take some Advil, and it's never really clear whether it worked or not. It's just, you, did I wait long enough that it went away, or did the Advil actually kick in? But eventually, you know, the, the headache is slightly less than it was before I took it. There's a, there's, I know what to do in this situation. But when you're sitting across that table from somebody who's hurting, there is no easy fix. And whether it's money or relationships or job or your health or situations in culture in the world that you have no impact over, but they have all the impact over you, whether it's a few years ago during a pandemic when all of our lives got shifted due to no fault of our own, probably. I don't know your story, but maybe. Depending on where we come from, there's all these different effects on our life that we were not necessarily the cause. Sometimes it's pretty clear. You are the cause. You did make that 30-second decision, and it was a dumb decision, but you're having to live with the consequences and try to unravel that. But when you feel trapped in the crisis, it's this sense of, I am powerless to change this. And even if I had the power, I don't know what I would do because I don't know what the next steps are. And I don't even know who to ask for help. Enter in Jehoshaphat, Second Chronicles chapter 20, who we will learn praises God who is faithful even as we fear. Here's how his story goes. To give you kind of prep for where Jehoshaphat comes from, he's the king of Judah. Uh, there's a whole story leading up to this, how David was king of Israel, and then his son Solomon, and then Solomon's two kids split the kingdom. And... Judah went south, Israel went north, and now you have two kingdoms. It used to be one, Israel, now it's two. And they each have their own kings, and honestly, most of each of them are bad. But Jehoshaphat's a pretty good one. He has his flaws, but he's, he's pretty human. It's one of the things I like about him. Um, here's his story. It says, after this, in chapter 20, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Muonites, came against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A great multitude is coming against you from Edom, beyond the sea. And behold, they are in Hazazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. There's a lot of people coming at you, Jehoshaphat. You're the king, heads up, there's a whole army coming at you. It's a very big army, it's not just one army, it's several that are working together to come at you. This is too much. This is going to be too much for you to handle. And... Just like those circumstances I read, this isn't fixable. This isn't a matter of, you know what, we're well-trained enough, we can take on four armies. Maybe one. Two chapters ago, him and the king of Israel worked together to go after one of these guys in chapter 18. And even though God said, don't do that, and Joseph asked, like, no, I'm working together, we got this, which was his flaw. And then he gets reprimanded for it in chapter 19, 
but then he takes all the idols out of his land in 19, so God's like, I'm on your side. Don't do that again. Now, four armies are coming at you. This is a problem. Capital P, capital P problem. We need help. When the problem, you see the problem. The problem is rarely difficult to identify. That part's pretty clear. In this large equation that we're going to walk through, the problem is easy to see. Verse 3, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He was afraid. This is, any normal person is going to be afraid. Anybody who has the reasonable ability to analyze the situation when the problem is a capital P problem in your life or the life of those you lead and love, you get afraid. Because it's not difficult to analyze. Can I take that? Could, could, would I be able to take uh, all four armies at once? Definitely not. Oh no, what am I going to do? When that problem hits, you get afraid. Is it wrong to be afraid? Not necessarily. What you do with that fear, fear is just a, an emotional reaction. You don't always want to follow your emotions. Uh, Tony Plummer is the one who told me this. Your emotions are good followers but bad leaders. Don't follow your emotions. Don't let your emotions lead you. But also feel them. The goal isn't to push them away. Fear is a good response when you realize that something is coming at you that you can't handle. What do you do with it? Where do you take it? Jeho Jehoshaphat was afraid. And see what he did? He set his face to seek the Lord. What do you do when you get afraid? There's fight, flight, freeze. Some version of that is probably you. Focus on God. Whatever your, your uh, you know, amygdala response is, to come back at somebody, to run away from somebody, to freeze in the light of that somebody, you turn your eyes to the Lord. You get your focus off of the thing, off of the problem, and you set your face to seek the Lord. And for him, it was, we're all going to stop eating. We're going to fast. And that's not so that we can save food or something. It's, if you ever fasted before, the goal is to take the, the hunger that lives inside of you physically and to redirect that towards a hunger for God. Because when you realize that our nation is going to be destroyed, food doesn't matter quite as much. When everything's going great, eat all you want. It's fine. But your prayers change when the problem is a capital P. Look at verse 4. So what do they do? Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. This word seek is the Hebrew word to require or beg. The problem, capital P problem, became a capital P prayer. We need help. They all came together to seek the Lord. You know how your prayers shift? When things are going well, and this isn't a bad thing, but your prayers have a different level of intensity. Likely, at least mine do. God bless my family. Pray you bless his day at work. Keep us safe. Amen. Kid, get out of the car. We got to go. The line's backing up. Um, this is how it goes. But when you have a capital P problem and you feel like the world is about to come on you, that's when you are physically on your knees and you're praying, God, please, you got to come through. You have to come through. I don't have another answer, God. This is happening today. You've been that way? You've been that level of intensity? Sometimes it's for you. Sometimes it's on behalf of the other person on the other side of the table. But that prayer gets intense. And the problem led to a prayer. And who came together? The entire nation. They genuinely wanted God in this moment. Listen, I know there's a whole generation that wasn't around for 9-11, so you've read this in history books, which isn't that a weird thing? I talk to a lot of students who it's just, it's a history book conversation. Um, but you remember the Sunday after 9-11? 9-11 was on a Tuesday. We had five days to process this. Churches were packed. The entire nation came together because there is something that we don't know what's happening this feels insurmountable. We got sucker punched, and we need help. Dear God, help us. We don't know what to do. And it faded pretty quick. 
But there was a Sunday there where every church in America was packed because we needed help. And then we started pointing fingers. And then we said, now nah, we can handle this ourselves. Everything kind of fell apart. But there was a moment, and that's what they're doing here. Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, the entire nation, they came together. Verse 5, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of, Jer of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. They seek God in crisis. From the middle of the court, this area where when Solomon dedicated this temple, he prayed this prayer uh, several chapters ago in Chronicles. He prays this prayer. He says, God, when we pray to ask you for help, we know that you will come through because this place is yours and you have put your name on this nation. And so he stands in the middle of that court, the same court that Solomon prayed in, and he stands in front of God. He says, he stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, the house of the Lord, before the new court. Again, he had made some mistakes in chapter 18. He fought with a guy that God told him not to fight with, which is weird because he did all the right preparation. Have you ever done everything right leading up to the decision? And then when the decision comes, you're like, nah, I'm just going to do it anyways. That's kind of how he was. Because the king Ahab of Israel was like, hey, we should go to battle against these people. And Jehoshaphat's like, I don't know if that's a good idea. We should probably ask a prophet. And Ahab says, who needs a prophet? We got these 400 guys. What do you say? And they're like, let's go to war. And Jehoshaphat's like, I don't think that's a good way to do this. And so he's like, we need one prophet instead of 400 dudes. So he gets one prophet, and the prophet says, you shouldn't do this because God is not behind it. He's like, that's a great point. We're going to go to war. It's like, ah, no. And we do this. And, and you, you do all the right work ahead of time. You pray, you, pray, you ask for wise counsel. Um, should I buy this house? Should I get this car? Um, should I marry this person? Everybody's like, no, don't marry that person. They're terrible. You're like, I don't Maybe, maybe, but maybe they're not. They're like, no, they're definitely terrible. And then you're like, I'm just, I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm just going to do it anyway. Is that cool? Like, no, it's not cool. Like, I'm going to do it anyways. And, we, and sometimes you've had this conversation with your own children, sometimes with your own parents. Like, you should, you've, you've gone through this once. Don't go through it again. And so he makes the mistakes. They get beat down. Ahab gets shot and killed. They should have killed Jehoshaphat, but God turned the people away from Jehoshaphat. And saved him. So that in 19, he realizes, I was shown a lot of mercy. I should have died. I didn't die. We're getting rid of all these idols, all the Ashereth poles and stuff, all these worship for other gods. In 19, he gets rid of them. So God's like, because, because you remove the idols, I will find favor with you again. And he's a good man with flaws. And in verse 6, and God said, or, or I'm sorry, Jehoshaphat said, O Lord, this is the prayer Jehoshaphat prays from the temple gates. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Now listen. The enemy's bearing down. We don't know if they're hours or days away, but it kind of doesn't matter. There's not enough time to prepare properly to fight. We need help now. And I think it's beautiful that you know what he does not start with? Oh, dear God, help us. We need help now. We're all going to die. That's kind of how I would go. <laughs> he starts with praising God for who he is. And this is what it looks like to set your face on the Lord. And I want you to see, I, I need to hear this. I, I need to hear this all week, and I want you to hear it too. It's not about God being the solution to your problem and to fix the problem. It's about getting your mind in your face off of the problem and setting it on God. And you do that in this moment. Oh, Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Remember how Jesus told us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's how you start your prayer. Let's remind ourselves of our positioning here. God is in heaven. We are on earth. In light of that, now we can talk. He is accessible Father. He is the one who welcomes you to his throne of grace so that you can receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. So he is the welcoming Abba, Daddy. But he is also mighty, righteous King. He is holy, holy, holy. 
and he is welcoming, and we need both of those. If he's just holy, 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 separate, and awesome, we have no access. But if he's just welcoming, that's sweet, but there's no power there. We need both, and he is both. How can you be both? I don't know. But he is perfectly both. And that's the God he's praying to. He says, if you have an ESV, then you see it, verse 6, uh, L-O-R-D, O Lord. It's capitalized, all caps. It's bad grammar, unless you're writing in the Bible, then that means the word Jehovah, Yahweh. This is the covenant name of God with the people of Israel. It means I am who I am. When he told Moses at the burning bush, Moses said, who should I say is sending me? He says, tell them I am that I am. He's like, that's not a name. That is a phrase. I don't know what to do with that. You heard me. No, you heard me correctly. Yahweh. And it's been translated in Jehovah. It's the same word. I am who I am. I am a self-sufficient God. He doesn't need us. There's nothing that we're bringing to the table that God needs. We are entirely in need of him. He needs nothing from us. Yet he comes to us and allows us access to him for our joy and his glory. It's beautiful. But it's a, it's a really important place that when you have the problem staring you in the face, you acknowledge that there is a God who is in heaven, who is you rule over all the kingdoms and nations. That nations is not an accidental word. That's not just a thing that you say. It might be a thing that they say. But in this moment, when I say you are king and you rule over all the nations, that's important because a few of those are coming at us. So I need to be reminded that you don't just rule in heaven. You rule over nations. And that is not any less true now, by the way. I don't understand how that all works because there are some terrible things going on right now. But I don't need to understand. I need to trust in the God who rules. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Theology matters, by the way. Knowing who God is. Theology is theos, is God. Theology is study of. Biology is study of life. Theology, the study of God, to know who God is. Who, who does God say that he is? Who do you know God to be? That changes everything. The idea, it's the A.W. Tozer quote that's been said from stage a thousand times. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. If you have a tiny little bobblehead Jesus that sits on your dash that you pray to because it's, you don't want to have road rage, that's a version, but that's not the God of the Bible. <laughs> that's not who God actually is. And so you pray to the God who actually reveals himself in Scripture. And in verse 7, he, t- he reminds God of who he is. Did you not, our God, drive out inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Again, he still hasn't asked God for anything. He, he uses questions to ask God of things that he's already promised. The Abrahamic covenant was real. The idea that God promised Abraham to give them this land. So when he says, did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel? And give it to Abraham, your friend. He's like, you've already done the things that are impossible. When they came out of Egypt, they were not a massive fighting force. They were a bunch of slaves. So the idea that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness made them better fighters, there's just no evidence for that. Because they walk in, the first place they overcome is Jericho. They did nothing to do it. They just blew trumpets and screamed and the walls fell down. They took the city. And every battle, every battle they won was won by God. And so he reminds God, did you not our God drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to your descendant? You know, he doesn't say, remember how faithful Joshua was to you and what a battle warrior he was? Because Joshua, while he was actually a very good warrior, it wasn't his credit that won. It was God. In verse 8, And they have lived in it 
and built for you in a sanctuary for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, the judgment, the pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. He says, and by the way, there's just such honesty in this prayer. If the disaster does come, we will stand here and we will continue to praise you. Because I don't know which one is your thing that you sit across the table and you're either confessing or receiving somebody else's confession, but some version of the sword, judgment, pestilence, famine, some version of that is what you're hearing and you're just able to say, whether that disaster hits or if God stays that disaster, you continue to praise. And we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save. Isn't that a weird thing? And this is, this is the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego approach. When, remember when Nebuchadnezzar's like, we're going to throw you in there. Just bow down. And they said, we don't know which one said it. But I want to find out when I get to heaven whether... It was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who said, we will not bow, and our God will save us. But even if he doesn't save it, we're not going to bow. Well, what does that mean? Our God will save us, but even if he doesn't save us, we're not going to bow. It's saying what he's saying. You will save us from this disaster, but even if the disaster comes, we're going to continue to cry out to you. Because what other choice do you have? He's the only one that can save if it's not like, well, if he doesn't save, we better go to plan B. Now there's no plan B. You have to come through. And he still, hasn't, he still hasn't asked for anything specific yet. We are not cooperating with God. God is the one who saves. And now, in verse 10, And now behold, the men of Ammon and Moab and Seir, you see, now he's starting to get specific, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, and whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they reward us by coming to drive us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. He's like, God, we didn't come here. Like, this wasn't our idea. You put us here. So if you put us here, you've won all the battles before. We don't make any pretense like we can win them now. You have to win this one too. Can you see the freedom that starts to build when you start to pray like this? It's not that there's not still an enemy, but you're, when you set your face on God mid-crisis, you start to get perspective. The crisis is still very much there. But for Jehoshaphat, he's setting a nation's mind and their eyes to see, oh yeah, this isn't really on us. We didn't bring ourselves here. We didn't get ourselves to this point, so we're not going to be able to advance further. God, if they destroy all of us, you can't fulfill your promise. So you're going to have to take care of them in order for you to fulfill your promise. So this is all we got. And then there's this beautiful verse. If you're, if you're looking for a verse to memorize, you're like, I just don't know which one to go with. Verse 12 is your one. Maybe you don't, ju don't, don't just memorize the first part of it because then it'll get weird. Oh God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Listen to this. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Is that just a sweet place to be? God, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to keep watching you. There's going to be a point this week where you pray that prayer. Maybe on behalf of yourself, on behalf of someone you care about, on behalf of our nation, this world, the unsaved people, that you're like, God, that person is not savable. I mean, I know you can, but I don't see a route. They've shut every door to any kind of gospel that I've tried to present. I don't know what to do. So I'm just going to keep watching you. You have to change your focus. You get your focus on the only one who can get you through this. Because our greatest position, remember what Jesus calls, he calls a sheep. You know what defense a sheep has? Nothing. A sheep has nothing. It, it doesn't camouflage well as a white animal in a green field. 
It's the reason why they make golf balls white, because they show up on the green. Um, they're really visible, sheep are. They're not especially fast. They're delicious. So it's not, like, there, there's very little that's helping you avoid predators. You know what their only defense is? Where's the shepherd? Where's the shepherd? Oh, good, the shepherd's here. I'm just going to cower by you. Because the shepherd's really strong. The shepherd's got a stick. The shepherd has a hook to pull you back when you, get, when you make dumb decisions, get yourself stuck in a ditch, and it can pull you back up. It has a pointy end that can jab you in the right direction so you don't fall in the ditch. And then when the wolf comes, the shepherd fights off the wolf. Our only defense is a sheep's only defense. A sheep is like, I don't know what to do against that wolf. I better pay attention to this shepherd. Shepherd, help. And the shepherd helps. That's all we got. Be encouraged. Your strength matters very little against that capital P problem. So we bring what we've got, which is a voice to say, God, you are great. You have been great. You're the one that brought us here. I don't know what to do. So do something. This is the prayer of Moses and Joshua and Gideon. And it's what I tell students whose parents are split and they're stuck. Because one thing to talk about that conversation, you know, when, when you guys are going through an issue, you have agency. Like, you can leave. When you're a sophomore in high school, the best you get is you only got two and a half more years. And then you can go. And it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough for a while. And it's okay to not know what to do. But you just keep your eyes on God. And that feels so helpless because you want to fix that. And oftentimes you just can't. I mean, there are times when you say, we got, we got to get you out, that's bad enough. Uh, we call the authorities. But there's sometimes when it's just manipulative parents who are just pressing and pressing and pressing. So I don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. The first time I heard this verse referenced with any kind of meaning was, oh man, 14 years ago. I started here 14 years ago as a youth pastor. I remember sitting with Tony Plummer in the elders meeting that first time, and Tony was going over this. I, and I, I was talking about, so how do you guys lead? Like, what's, the, what's your vision statement? What's your mission? What do you do here? He's like, yeah, we don't have any of that stuff. It's like, that doesn't seem like a good plan. I didn't say that because I was 30 years old and he was smart. And I said, but so what do you do then? And he said, here's what we do. And he said, open up the second Chronicles chapter 20. And he said, this is the prayer we pray every time we meet as elders. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Which sounds great. But like, what is it that you do? You know, like, yes, for sure. However, the thing that you have to do, what is it? And he said, hey, that is the thing. I was like, Can it, is that allowed? Are we just allowed to do that? Are we allowed to just wait on God to tell us what to do next? Because that feels very nebulous. It feels like you can kind of make that anything you want. He's like, well, you certainly could. But what if you don't? What if you don't make it anything you want? What if you have people that genuinely are seeking out the will of God? And then they find it together and then we take the next step. I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool, but nobody does that. But what if we did? And I was like, oh, yeah, what if we did? What if you just ran a church like that? What if you just had a place that said, God, what do we do next? You, you get a place where he's like, the one thing we're not going to do is get property and build a big building. And then God's like, I'm going to give you 27 acres in Venice that uh, is not accessible any other way unless it's just given. Like, I, I, I guess this is what we're going to do. God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He's like, this is what your eyes are on me for, so I can show you this step. Okay. I'm telling you, it was, su it was such a paradigm shift for me, coming from pr so many previous church experiences to be like, Man, I know that sounds good, but it's so easy to mess that up. He's like, it certainly is. But what if you just keep the humility to keep following that next step? 
And 14 years later, you see what that looks like. You're like, man, what a healthy way to do life, let alone run a church. Like, what if you just do that in your own life? Go ahead and have goals, you know, like have ambitious ideas. And then say, God, this is what we got. What do you want us to do? You set your face on God. But what do you do? Verse 13. Meanwhile, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Which I just want to say is very cool. That it wasn't just the men getting together to tell everybody else what to do. This was like, hey, we need everybody. God loves the prayers of kids. Bring them along. We're going to get the wives. We're going to get the children. This is like the difference between our people existing or not. We're bringing all the prayers. So they're honest. And you ever hear kids pray? There is so much value. Just listen to kids pray. If, if you've ever thought about serving with children before, I encourage you, and this sounds like something a family pastor is supposed to say, but I, they say it for a reason. You will get more out of it than they do most weeks. There are some weeks where you're like, that was rough. <laughs> but you still leave with goldfish, so it's all right. But when you hear the prayers, listen, they see what's happening, by the way. They're very aware. They might not be able to explain what's happening with their parents or their grandparents, but they tell us the things that are happening. And we're, sometimes we're like, okay, okay, uh, you, can, you can stop. Uh, I don't need to know that much. But they know. And when they pray, I think God, it's one of the reasons why God says, unless you come to me like one of these ch uh, children, when Jesus invites the children, he's like, you can't enter into my kingdom. He's like, there is such a beauty and an honesty and a sincerity about their prayers, God loves those prayers. So he brings, they bring the children along. And watch what happens when they pray. So, this, so far, there's been a problem, and there's been a prayer. And then verse 14, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, son of Metaniah, the Levite, son of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. Jehaziel. This is the only time he's mentioned, but it's a pretty big deal. And the word of God shows up through this guy. The problem led to a prayer that has now brought a prophet. There is a word from God. And the word rarely comes from a place you'd expect, by the way. Maybe some of you this morning are like, I did not expect to hear a word that I needed from Second Chronicles. This is the word for you. There was prophets in the Old Testament. Now we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you, lives inside of the people who are following Jesus that you do community with. And sometimes they'll say things like, oh, shoot, I didn't realize how much I needed to hear that. Now I got to do something about it. Well, he says this. And he said, this prophet of God, in verse 15, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. That's everybody who's present, right? All of, they're in Jerusalem. All the inhabitants of Judah are there. King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Now listen, this prayer is going to go on, but I just want to stop here because I feel like a lot of times we need to process this part. He leads with don't be afraid, which I've heard a lot of people say there's 365 times in the Bible where it says don't be afraid. Kind of depends on your translation, but there's at least 175. So people are like, there's not actually 365 that equal the days of the year. That's just the thing that preachers say. And it is, but let's just say there's only 175. Read each one of them twice, you'll be good. So <laughs> there, this time he's telling you, don't be afraid. Now let me ask you, when you are facing the capital P problem that gives you justifiable reason to be afraid, does it help you when somebody says, hey, have you thought about not being afraid? I go, that doesn't help me at all. That's actually kind of a jerk move. Don't do that to me. Don't sit across the table from me and tell me, have you thought about having less anxiety? I mean, depression probably doesn't feel very good. Maybe just stop. No, that doesn't help. But, so that can't be all they say, but it's okay that they say that. It just can't be all that's said. And so he follows it up with more. Do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed. Dismayed it probably isn't a word that uh, flows out of your mouth very often. It's not mine. I think we all have a general understanding of what it means, but I wanted to see, like, what does that word mean? And let me tell you, it's, it's a potent word. It means shattered. 
And I, that word hit. Afraid, I get. But there is something particular about the problems that hit. There's something particular about the problems I sat across the table from these last couple weeks. And I sat across some shattered people. Broken. And broken doesn't even do it justice. That word shattered. It's like, man, I'm not in two pieces. I'm in a thousand pieces. And before that phone call, I was like one piece. And everything just broke. And he's like, hey, you don't have to be. It's understandable why you are. But this prophet of God is telling the people of God who have reason to feel like we're literally all going to die. And they had reason to believe that was an actual thing. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed and shattered. Because you know what? He admits there is a great horde. A horde is a lot of people. I don't know how many quantifies as a horde. It's a lot. It's a lot to make your problem a little P to a capital P. And he just wants you to know, I understand. Like, you are, The thing that you are facing really is the thing that you're facing. The crisis really is a crisis. But the battle isn't yours, it's God's. Which is great. But what do I do? <laughs> have you had that? You're like, okay, that's actually really comforting. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be dismayed. I keep my eyes set on you because I don't know what to do. Oh, the battle is God's and not mine? Fantastic. But like, what do I do when I get up tomorrow? <laughs> like when we leave here and I get in my car and everything's still the thing? What do I do? And so he tells them. Verse 16. Tomorrow... Go down against them. And behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. Okay? So tomorrow, here's what you do tomorrow. You get up and you go down against them. And if, in my mind, I'm like, hey, didn't you just say the battle is yours and not ours? Now you're like, go down and get to battle? This feels like... This feels like an opposite to the answer that you said. But you know what? You take the step. Because one of the, what, here, one of the clearest things I've learned is that when God gives you a destination, he will very rarely, I want to say never, but I can't say never, he very rarely will give you the full path. And you'll be like, if, my, if I'm starting here and my destination is there, it feels like the path should be there. And God's like, here's step one. Step over here. You're like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to get there. He's like, just, that's the path that's lit up. And sometimes you're like, listen, I know better than you do. Back there is back there. I'm headed this way. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> so instead, you're like, I don't know why, but I'll step here. <laughs> Great. I'll let you know when step two comes. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> I need it now. So he's like, tomorrow morning, get up and go to battle. So what's going to happen is, whatever your capital P problem is, you're going to start praying about it, and God's going to be like, I want you to take this step. And you're like, I don't know if that's the right move. He's like, I'm, trust me. Trust me. And you'll take the step, and you'll be like, this, this doesn't make me any more comfortable, but my eyes are on you. I, I still don't know what to do. Having taken step one, he's like, good news, there's only 800 more steps. You're like, ah, seriously? Okay, I mean, okay, I trust you. And verse 17, he clarifies. He says, you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm. Hold your position. And see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them and the Lord will be with you. Ah, okay. Now we get some clarity. Here's your battle plan. You're not going to fight. You're actually just going to stand firm. And then you're going to stay there, standing. You're going to watch God win. Like, I don't know what that means. But okay. At least there's some understanding, like, once you get there, here's my expectations of you. Just stand still. Like, I can do that. Okay. Because... If there's a great horde coming at me, standing still makes about as much sense as fighting because we can't take them either way. So 
your pathway is. He just, I love that he leads with, you will not need to fight in this battle. Like, that's what a battle is. It's not a battle if there aren't two sides fighting. Yet, he's telling a whole side, you're not going to need to fight. Just stand firm, hold your position, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. Because, and then he repeats what he started with, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Doesn't have a lot more power now that you know what you're going to be doing. He's like, now, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be dismayed. Because the only thing I'm asking you to do is show up and stand still. And tomorrow you will go out against them. And the Lord will be with you. All right. I, everybody looks at Jehoshaphat like the prophecy is over. King, does that seem reasonable? You prayed, God, you're faithful. You brought us here. My eyes are set on you. I don't know what to do. This guy stands up. He says, hey, I got a word from the Lord. You're going to go down and do nothing. God's got this. King, is that, are we going to do that? Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head in verse 18 with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord. You know what they did? Worshiping the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful response? What was their response to God, you are good. You are who you said you were. You're the one that brought us here. You have to come through. And God's response being, you're right. I am good. I am the one who's going to fight this. You show up and stand still. I'm going to win all this. Praise God, there's an answer. <laughs> Listen, worship looks different on the front and back side of a crisis. But it belongs in both. On the front side, you fall down on your face like, oh, there's an answer there's an actual answer to this crisis. I'm not totally sure how it's going to play out yet. But at least there's an answer. And verse 19, the Levites and the Kohathites and the Korahites all stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. You see, their problem led to a prayer. And that prayer gave them a prophet. And that prophet led them to praise and now they praise. Because you know who these guys are? The Levites are the priests. The Kohathites are the guys who carried the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, into battle, into Jerusalem. And the Korahites, listen, there's a whole story with the Korahites. Let's just say there's a whole group of Korahites that got swallowed up by the earth because they revolted against Moses, which is a bad sign. That's a sign that God is against you when he swallows you up by the earth and shuts it back up. But some of them who were left over, like, Hey, we're on God's side now, so uh, let's, let's worship Jesus. They end up becoming the worship leaders of Israel. The sons of Korah wrote some of the greatest hits in all of your psalms. Hits you might know, such as Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the flowing stream, so my soul longs after you, O God. Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God. The guys who are leading worship in this moment after that prophecy are the people who wrote some of the psalms that we still sing to praise God now. This was their job, and they led well. Look at verse 20. So that next morning, they rose early in the morning, and they went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. The night before, they had been on their face worshiping God. Now they stand with confidence. And Jehoshaphat, their leader, their king, says, He's going to do what he said he was going to do. Because when you have the word of God, you don't have to question. I don't know how this situation is going to turn out. But either way, we're not bowing down. Maybe the disaster hits, but either way, we're going to keep crying out. Verse 21. When he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. You see who he just sent out first? They went out before the army. You know that your plan is to follow God and to not fight when the people that lead are your worship leaders. Like, this is how we're going to fight. We're going to fight by saying, God, 
do something awesome. Now listen, if I was, if I was Joseph, I'd be like, hey, uh, worship leaders, go out ahead of us, and I want you to sing, the Lord of hosts is great and mighty, and he slaughters his enemies. The Lord of hosts, the God of the angel armies, is going to destroy everyone who calls his promised land theirs. Instead, he leads with what is objectively not a great battle cry. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. Which is great. Like, we really need that. But it's not a super inspiring, let's kill all the enemies, battle cry. But they were never the ones who were going to kill them. God's love is everything they had. And when you're mid-crisis and you set your eyes on God... And you say, God, I don't know what to do when my eyes are on you. This is the part we need to remember. God, your steadfast love endures forever. I don't have another, I don't have another route. I need your love. And if that love is true, you will take care of my enemies. You will take care of me. And I don't have to worry. That word, his steadfast love, is his said. If you've been here very long, you know that's a special word from this stage. It is his loving kindness. It's his unique relational bond with us. A loving kindness. Right now, down at 1035, they're learning about the kindness of God with children. What it means to show others the kindness of God. This is an expression of the kindness of God. We're going to go down to battle, and what we're relying on, God, is your loving kindness. Your unique relational bond with us. Mid-crisis, we praise. We praise and we lead with praise. And we ask God, please take this. We are no longer going to claim control over this crisis. It is yours now. I heard Tony Evans say it like this. He said, uh, you ever watch a football game and you see uh, everybody's running after the quarterback and the quarterback's going to die until he hands the ball off. Then nobody cares about the quarterback anymore because they can't touch him. And so, and now everybody wants to kill the running back. And it's not my problem anymore. I handed it off. And this is what we do. You hand off the problem. You say, God, this is not my crisis anymore. It is yours. And you have to deal with it. And God's like, I am more than capable. Give it to me. I've got it. So what do you do? You watch him win. Verse 22, and when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. What role did Judah play in Judah's victory? Judah watched. They prayed, they praised, and they watched. This is, remember what God says to, uh, to Moses right before he splits the Red Sea? Um, he says, you need only to be still. God will fight for you. And again, Moses, the only part he played in that process was raising a stick over water. And I tried this as a kid because I remember hearing that story. I'm like, I'm going to try that when I go to the beach. It never works. You have to have God to be the one to part those oceans, to part that sea. God will fight for you. But they still showed up. See what happens is verse 23. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. See, evil has a tendency to consume itself. So God put the enemies against each other. There were three armies coming at one opponent until one army got upset the other two. and They took them over and then they fought amongst each other. And so... Israel or Judah's just standing there watching this. And verse 24, when Judah came to the watchtower of the wilderness, they looked towards the horde, and behold, there were dead bodies lying on the ground. None had escaped. Again, what did they do to obtain victory over enemies that were completely routed? They prayed, and they showed up, and they... You know why God wanted them to show up? is so they could see what he did. They didn't need to be there. 
The whole thing of tomorrow you will get up and go down against the enemy wasn't so they would play a part in it, so they could see with their eyes what God did. And then they did, and they praised God more. Look at verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take their spoil, they found among them in great numbers goods, clothing, precious things, which they took for themselves until they could carry no more. They were there three days taking up the spoil. It was so much. This turns out very, very differently. They just wanted not to die. They did not expect blessing on top of it. And isn't this us? Like, isn't that what mercy and grace is to us? Isn't that what the cross is? Good Friday is the worst day of the year. Like, it's the worst day in the history of history. Because God died at the hands of his own creation. And we call it good because Sunday happens. Not only do we have a Savior who didn't count our sins against us, but he became sin for us so that he might die on the cross to resurrect and forgive us of that. And in this beautiful exchange, he gives us salvation. It is so unfair in the best way. Not only do we not get punished, which raises us up to level, we get the mercy of God, but we get the grace of God of eternal life. Just to not experience the hell that we've made for ourselves as an eternal damnation that we've deserved. That's enough to praise God for the rest of our lives. He's like, hey, it's not just that, though. You get heaven. Not only are your sins not counted against you, you get counted towards you the perfection of Jesus. When God sees you, he sees Jesus. Not only are your enemies destroyed, you get all their plunder. You get all their stuff. Not only did you not die, you're better off now than you would have if they didn't attack you. That's the most beautifully unfair battle that's happened. And on the fourth day, verse 26, they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the same name has been called the valley of Barakah to this day. Then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat at their head, returning to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of the Lord. Man, if you praised him before at his answer that was going to happen, how much more are you going to praise him now that the answer has shown up? That's heaven. If we praise him now at the promise of what's to come, what's it going to be like when it actually shows up? What's it going to be like when we're there? Praise belongs in every piece, but it's a different level at each one. Verse 29 This is what happens when God shows up. And the fear of God came on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for God gave him rest all around. So you praise God. Even as you fear, even as you don't know what to do, you praise God. And he shows up. And I don't know what this looks like. It's, it, listen, it's just not going to be as clean of a crisis management as this looks, okay? Uh, we were at summer camp one time up in Daytona with, where we take the high schoolers, and Louis Giglio's mother had just passed away, and he said, and he preached this message on the raising of Lazarus from the dead. I'll never forget the title of his message. It was called, He Could Have, But He Didn't, But He Did. He's like, man, Lazarus was dying, and Jesus intentionally stayed away for a few days so that he would be good and dead. And when he showed up, his sister says, you could have saved him. Why didn't you just show up? You could have, but you didn't. And that's not okay. And she wept, and Jesus wept, and then he raised him from the dead. He could have saved him, but he didn't. But then he did. And on some timeline version, that's all of our version of a crisis. Listen, Paul and Silas didn't know what was going to happen when they were in that. They weren't singing because they were 
planning on an earthquake breaking the doors open, they would be able to leave. Paul and Silas just sang praise to God because they're in prison for following Jesus. And so we're, you're not going to stop us from praising God. They praise God mid-crisis. And yes, God did break the chains, blow the doors open, save the jailer and his whole family. Like it ends up in a pretty remarkable way. But sometimes you praise God as John the Baptist did and you end up arrested and your head's on a platter at some girl's birthday party. It doesn't end up great. And you're like, yeah, that's my crisis. That's kind of how it feels. It went terrible. I praise God and it got worse. Let me finish with this. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's where this is the perspective we live in, is where old death is your victory, where old death is your sting. Jesus Christ has plundered death. It no longer has power anymore. It still hurts. It's still hard. But that's not where we live. We don't live in the fear of that. Jesus already beat it. He plundered it on the battlefield. And on the other side of it, like, your body will die. All of our bodies will die, but you will not. Which is a weird thought. But you will not. You will live forever one place or another. And Jesus says, man, that death is just the beginning of a life that you didn't even know was possible. This right here is a vapor, and it feels like it is everything. And that crisis is real. But on the other side of this is life. So praise God, who is faithful even as we fear. Because even though the crisis might not turn out how you like or how you would hope or as clean as this one, there is life on the other side. But for now, it's okay to just simply pray, God, I don't know what to do, so my eyes are on you. So God, this is what we pray. For so many of us here who are trying to help somebody else through a crisis, who are going through one of our own, we just admit we don't know what to do, so help us. Fix what is unfixable, defeat what is undefeatable, and on the other side of it, help us to look back and praise in the middle of it, help us to look up to you in praise. On the front of it, help us to look to you for help as we praise. This is the only battle plan we have, and we trust you with it. Bless each individual man and woman who is here to give them the courage this week, because it's going to hit this week, God. Give us your Holy Spirit-led courage to look to you and say, I don't know what to do, but my face and my eyes are on you. And then show us the next step. And give us the courage to take it. So let me pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.